All right, the last month or so, we've been looking at uh, four men who were former Puritans. Um, they became Baptists, and wonder, God used them in wonderful ways throughout New England. If you remember, we, we studied uh, Roger Williams, Obadiah Holmes, Dr. John Clark, and even a man named Henry Dunster last week. With the exception of Henry Dunster, who really died of a broken heart, uh, young, 40, 48, 49 years old, these men all lived um, and died within a few years of each other in the 1680s. I'm just trying to give you some perspective now to, because we're taking a jump here in time. And they lived until the, the mid-1680s, uh, 1682, 1685. And we'll now leave that time. We're going to jump ahead uh, 50 or so years to the year 1740 in America. And this is the year that the English evangelist George Whitfield uh, comes to New England to preach. And uh, there is no doubt that Baptists in America owe a great debt of gratitude to George Whitfield. Again, as I mentioned, he's the English evangelist. Um, he came to America in 1739, 1740, and began to preach. And as he preached, uh, just thousands and thousands of people were saved. Uh, great revival swept the colonies. Uh, this is known, this time is known as the Great Awakening. He would come back several times, but he came back in 1745. I think that was his third time back in the colonies. And again, revival sweeps through the colonies. We call this the Second Great Awakening. Something interesting to me, as I read, is that in 1745, this is the, the third preaching trip of George Whitfield, the Second Great Awakening. He's only 29 years old at that point. Isn't that amazing? I guess I think of him as a 50 or 60 year old man. but. Um, and as these men, as these people were saved throughout the colonies, and, and literally Whitfield would preach to 20, 30, 40,000 people at a time. Um, it's just amazing his voice and uh, the, the, the capabilities of his voice, for one, in a day with no, no microphones. And um, again, just thousands of people saved throughout the colonies. But as these people were saved, they were driven back to their Bibles, maybe for the first time. And they went back to their congregational churches to worship really as the first time as, as newborn Christians. But they soon realized that their church, uh, these, all these individual congregational churches, that was the state church, uh, did not only preach the Bible incorrectly, but that much of the membership, including many times the pastors, were unsaved. So these newly saved people, and there were thousands of them across the, the colonies, um, were called new lights, as opposed to the old lights who rejected the revival and, and stayed in the churches. The new lights left the old churches and began to form new light congregational churches. But eventually they, you know, trying to reform the church from the inside out, that didn't work. They realized that over time and, and many, many of these churches became Baptist churches. Now this caused great turmoil. This was a great threat to the state church, if you can imagine. And as they began to continue in the word of God, they, they began to embrace believers immersion. Uh, the Baptist churches were called separates. That's a, a derisive term in that day. So they were separate themselves from the state church and they were called separates. And uh, of course they would embrace that term eventually, but uh, they were called separates. And, and uh, because of the thousands of, of being saved and truly turning to Christ, the state church was furious and Whitfield was greatly opposed uh, in, his, in his evangelistic preaching. His, his biblical message uh, saw true repentance and individual conversion, and the status quo hated him for it. Well, Whitfield himself lamented um, that these, these new converts were becoming Baptists. And he said in one occasion, this is a funny, funny uh, saying, or saying, phrase, he said, he said, I believe my chickens are all turning into ducks. And, and he was right, they were. And uh, this then is the tradition of the separate Baptists. And this is a term in history now we have uh, known as the separate Baptist churches. And um, the fire and fervor of, George, the, of the Whitfield revivals, uh, revival lived on in them. And, and ben Baptists really became the greatest beneficiary of the, of the Great Awakening. So a great revival was about to begin in the South. We now know that this revival will be the greatest revival in American history, uh, even surpassing the Great Awakenings. Uh, no one could have predicted that it would involve the hated and hunted Baptists. But after a preaching trip to North Carolina, Whitfield, talking about him still, he lamented uh, one time 
and he put this in his writings that, 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 that there were an absence of pastors and the preaching of the gospel. And he asked God specifically, and he used this phrase, he said he asked God specifically to send forth a John the Baptist to preach and baptize in the wilderness. And God would answer that prayer in a very dramatic way. So three Congregationalists were saved, um, or New Lights, would be the most notable conversions during the 1840s in the Great Awakening. And this morning we're going to look at the first of these, um, our 14th episode in uh, 50 Baptists You Should Know, and this morning we're going to look at the man Shubal Stearns. Now Shubal Stearns is not a stranger to us. He's one of my favorites, if not my favorite, so I get, every chance I get I try to talk about Shubal Stearns. But we're going to visit him again this morning and, and a little bit different take and talk about him and just to renew our interest in this time because this is one of the greatest periods of American history that we're about to head into. Shubal Stearns was born in Boston in January of 1706. He was raised in a congregational church as, as everybody basically was. In 1740, the Great Awakening swept across New England, as I mentioned, and through the preaching of George Whitfield, uh, Stearns was saved. In 1745, he did join the separates. Uh, he was eventually baptized. Uh, he felt that God was calling him to preach, and he soon was pastoring a Baptist church in Connecticut. Later, he would, he would pastor in Virginia. In June of 1755, Shubal Stearns received a letter from a lady in North Carolina, um, telling of a sincere desire of the inhabitants of that destitute area, spiritually destitute area, to hear the word of God. And the letter said this, this is a quote from the letter, the work of God was great in preaching to an ignorant people who had little or no preaching for a hundred miles and no established meeting. But now the people were so eager to hear that they would come from 40 miles each way when they could have an opportunity to hear such a sermon. Stearns, had felt for some time that God had a great work for him. He thought it was on the western frontier. He was going to move with the settlers going west and thought that was uh, possibly what God wanted. Uh, but he was uncertain. And now, after he got this letter, this was his Macedonian call. He felt that this was God showing him where he should go south to North Carolina. He quickly got his affairs in order. He encouraged his church members to come with him. And six couples decided to move with Stearns and his wife. Uh, again, an interesting note, when Stearns, when Stearns decided to move at this point, he's 50 years old, and um, on the way south, and this is a journey that's very difficult in that day, if you can imagine, you're, you're possibly in a wagon, but most likely you're walking or you're on horseback, and in Virginia, he stopped and met with his brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall, who joined Stearns in his journey south, and this team uh, would, would form these two men, Daniel Marshall and, and Shubal Stearns, uh, really would form a team that would compare to uh, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Just an amazing, these two men and what, what will happen, how God will use them. Now in 1755, there were three main roads that crossed through Virginia into North Carolina. The one ran north and south, I think it was called the Great Wagon Road. It, it, uh, it ran all the way up into uh, Pennsylvania and, and south into uh, South Carolina. Uh, there was a road that ran east and west through North Carolina, and then there was a road that came down uh, in, from, from Virginia. And uh, these trails, these three trails converged in a little notch in the wilderness in North Carolina near a small river named Sandy Creek. And when Stearns first saw this junction, he thought that this is exactly where God was leading him. Uh, he was not coming south for economic reasons, but he was coming to preach the gospel. And this was the strategic center from which he could itinerant his preachers and, and serve this destitute area. And he felt that if he could, if he could set up a work at that juncture where, where everybody crossed at one point or another, um, he could preach and he could preach so that the, the farms would hear him uh, many miles down the road as well as the people that were traveling. So they first built a meeting house in what was to be the center of the new community. And on November 22nd, 1755, these eight couples constituted Sandy Creek Baptist Church and they called Shubal Stearns to be their pastor. They quickly built houses, they gathered food for the winter, and Stearns began to preach as soon as they had installed a pulpit in the new meeting house. Uh, it is said that the singing from this little congregation could be heard for miles around for the neighboring farms and that people would come just to see what was happening, what in the world's going on, all this, where's the singing coming from? They had never heard the singing, but they for sure had never heard the preaching like they were about to, pre to hear. And uh, Shubal Stearns, one of his most, uh, I guess his, his greatest physical gift was his voice. 
and eyewitnesses to his ministry said that he used his voice to bring men to an earnest examination of themselves before God. Stearns and his preachers soon took to the fields and the towns and the farms, and it is said, uh, one biographer said, for them, religion was real, hell was real, Jesus was real, and you needed to be born again. And these men were a different kind of preacher. Um, they, they even looked different. They didn't have the robes of, uh, of the congregational preachers. And uh, they were filled with God's power, and God would bless in a way that, that has rarely been seen in history. And the Lord added to the church quite literally daily. Uh, the church grew from uh, those eight couples to 600 in about a year and a half, and that was just the beginning. And uh, more and more, as, as these people were saved, uh, 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 men were surrendered to God's call to preach the gospel. And we're going to finish the story of Shubal Stearns next week, and we're going to look at the second man who was saved about the same time as he was, uh, the second of our Congregationalist New Lights. And I want to thank the Lord for the separate Baptists. What a story. If I, could, if I could encourage you, if you want to read an exciting time in American history, um, I would encourage you to read. And, and, and we thank the Lord for their courage to follow the scripture wherever it would lead them. And I would pray that we have the same faith in our lives. And I do want to mention two books to you. I'm not sure uh, what's up uh, on the screen, but uh, I want to mention two books. One I mentioned the other day, this is uh, a, a book uh, a thicker book, but very, very well written, very easy to read. Uh, America in Crimson Red. I would. Uh, it is the Baptist story of, of a Baptist in America. I would encourage you. Our bookstore has it. In fact, the uh, young people in college. This is a, um, a text in the college. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to to read this book. But I also have another book that I'd recommend, and and this book is. Um, Maybe easier to digest, but uh, Baptist Foundations in the South. This is also in our bookstore, and I would recommend this to anyone, as uh, as this book tells the story of the uh, the time from 1754 to 1787, the great revival that spread spread through um, the South in uh, the unformed to be or form, soon to be formed United States. And so, I want to thank the Lord again for the separate Baptists, and specifically this morning for Shubal Stearns and his ministry.